great. Yeah. Um, okay, so hello and thank you so much for attending Her Plus Data today to listen to my talk about the three key skills of data science or the data science trilogy as I like to call them. So a very quick introduction to me just before we get started. So I'm Amy and I'm currently a data science team leader at Peak. I have about three and a half years of industry experience overall, but you'll hear kind of more about that shortly. So I won't go into too much detail about that. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free just to drop them into the chat and we can go through them at the Q&A at the end. So looking forward to see what questions you have to ask. Um, so I appreciate there might be like a bit of a mix of people here today, but I'm hoping that there's something that kind of all of you can take away from the session. So if you're a data scientist, I think it will help you to identify the key areas that you'd like to develop in for your future career. If you're not a data scientist, but think you'd like to be at some point in the future, then I think it will help you to gauge which skills you think you need to develop in before applying for a role kind of really boosting your chances when you decide to and then if you're not a data scientist and you also don't want to be then that's absolutely fine <laughs> we all kind of have our own kind of careers that we want to pursue um, but if that's the case then I think that because a lot of us obviously work in the data industry then some of these skills will apply to your role anyway and it will just be useful to kind of hear about um, a career path of another woman in the data industry. So before I kind of jump into what the three skills are, I thought I'd provide an example of a problem that data science can solve in practice um, as a way just to bring the skills to life a little bit more as we go through the presentation. So customer segmentation is a common marketing problem where the main objective is to split kind of an, an entire customer base into smaller groups that you can market to differently, depending on what it is that they're interested in. And I, I really like films. So the example that I've used throughout the presentation kind of centers around um, people that like going to the cinema. So hopefully that kind of immediately brings a few kind of ideas to mind, um, just as a few examples, like families like going to the cinema, equally people that just like eating popcorn might go to the cinema. Um, these are all people that you might want to kind of attract to come to your cinema if you owned one, um, but the way that you market to them would be completely different. So what is the data science trilogy? So um, whenever I'm speaking to people kind of at the recruitment stage, if they're asking about what skills are required or, or just kind of people that say I manage, I like to break the skills down into three different areas. So Theoretical knowledge is really the foundation of data science because this includes learning about different modeling techniques that you can apply and use on data. So things like machine learning, maths and statistics, like I've mentioned there. Um, but then you also need programming skills in order to actually do data science rather than just know the theory that sits behind it as um, being able to code in things like R and Python means that you can actually build data science models. And then last but not least, there are also commercial skills, um, which can often be overlooked, um, given that data science is kind of a technical field, but they're really important because um, if you're going to use data science to solve a problem, then you need to understand the problem that it is that you're solving. And you also need to be able to communicate effectively what your models are doing back to the people that are going to be using it who often aren't data scientists. So in terms of my own personal career, I've learned these three different skills um, kind of at different points in the career. So my the rest of my presentation will kind of take you through where I've learned each of these skills and also apply them to that customer segmentation problem that I just went through in the previous slide. So you'll see that there's lots of film pictures throughout. <laughs> <laughs> so classic, a classic one here. Um, so my career journey, I'm sure is the same with a lot of people, starts with education. So when I started studying um, my A-levels at 16, I thought, actually thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, so I studied quite a broad range of different subjects, as you can see there. 
Um, but I quickly realised that maths was what really interested me. Um, so I went to university to study maths and ended up specialising in statistics because I really liked the kind of more practical applications of the subject. And I think I learned quite an important career lesson um, whilst kind of in education, which I still use today, which is to do what you enjoy, which can sound quite simple and sound like quite generic advice, advice to be honest. But I think it can often be overlooked when you're thinking about what the next step is that you want to take in your career. Because there have been times um, where I've not really known what I've wanted to do next. So thinking about what I enjoy has been like a good place to start when I don't know what my plan is going to be. Um, kind of on the flip side of that, I think sometimes you can have this really set idea of what it is that you want to do and what you want to achieve. You might be the kind of person who wants like a five year plan. Um, but sometimes like your interests do change, like we're all people, we're not kind of static. And so you've just got to be kind to yourself. I think if you realize that your interests have shifted and therefore your plan needs to change, you don't need to feel bad about that. You should just kind of follow and continue what you enjoy doing. Um, so what theory did I learn at university that could help me with customer segmentation? So unsupervised and supervised methods are quite broad umbrella terms for different types of models that you can use in data science. So unsupervised methods search for unknown patterns in data. And that can sound like a little bit abstract at first, but ultimately what they're trying to do is look for similarities within data that you have. Um, so an example that I've included here is that if you had data on different species of animals or dinosaurs, including ones that have been like not discovered before, that you could use unsupervised methods to try to group together similar species of animals or dinosaurs. Um, on the other hand, supervised methods look for known patterns in data. And what I mean by that is that you have a particular outcome that you are trying to predict based on a set of inputs. Um, so a common example that's used for this is um, predicting which passengers on the Titanic would survive based on their age, class, gender, and kind of other characteristics similar to that. So <clears throat> that theoretical knowledge can help us to come up with a few different ways that we can solve the customer segmentation problem. And if you've not looked into customer segmentation before, if you have, if you give it a quick Google, um, often what comes out as one of the top approaches to solve it is unsupervised methods, um, because algorithms like k-means clustering can be used to kind of take in information about customers and then group them together based on similar characteristics, which I've shown kind of on the left there. But you can also use supervised methods to um, kind of create segments of customers. So you might want to understand who your best customers are. So in this case, who are the best customers that come to the cinema, which in my diagram are the people with the hats on. I couldn't think of any other way to do it. So <laughs> they've all got party hats on. Um, and you can use supervised methods such as decision trees um, to identify the characteristics that are most common among your best customers. So in this case, it's the people that like popcorn and watch more than two films a week. Um, so at this point, you kind of have two different approaches, theoretically, that you could take to solve the same problem. You might not know which one is best going forwards, um, but this is where the commercial skills that you have can kind of help to make that decision for you. So um, after university, I had two jobs that were both in the marketing industry. I also appreciate this as a TV reference, not a film one, but it's fine. It was just the best picture for the job. Um, so my first role was at a market research agency and it was a smaller company and it had a really great culture. I love the people there, um, but the role itself didn't really have enough maths in to keep me interested. Um, so I moved to a global media agency where my day to day role involved building statistical models to predict how effective different marketing channels were. Um, so the day to day job was a lot more interesting, definitely ticked a lot of boxes on the maths front. 
um, I worked with an amazing set of people again, but because the company was so large in comparison to the, the first company I worked at, I felt that overall I wasn't kind of making the difference that I wanted to in the company. And that leads me nicely onto my second career lesson, which is like that the, the role and the company and also the people that you work with are all things that you should consider when picking kind of the best role and opportunity for you. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can see a bit with my career path, like I've not got it right the first time round. There was like a, pros and cons of different places I've worked at. And that's absolutely fine because it just helps you to learn what your preferences are um, so that then when you're looking for that next role, you can think about what the role is, what the company is and who the people you'll be working with will be like to try and get that balance going forward. Um, yeah, so I think it's a big lesson for me because often when you look at job ads it's quite it's quite easy just to focus on what the job is and not much outside of that so both of these roles required a lot of commercial skills um, with them both being in the marketing industry and often people think of commercial skills as mainly being about communication but in data science i think that there are a few different skills that are worth looking into as well as that so um, industry and domain knowledge is important because ultimately data science projects have very practical applications. So it means that in order to solve the problem in the best way, you need knowledge and experience in that area in order to make sure you are taking everything that you need to into account. And as well as that, one of the kind of most important skills, I think, as a data scientist is then being able to translate that real world problem into a data science problem which is what we call problem formulation. And that's where you kind of take the theoretical knowledge that you have about kind of different algorithms and modeling techniques. And you also combine that with your knowledge of the industry and the domain, and you match the two so that you can understand almost what theoretical techniques can be used to best solve your industry or real world problem. And kind of finally, you need to be able to translate your solution back to the end customer. So that obviously includes like a lot of communication skills um, because there are a lot of complicated ideas and things in data science that you'll need to be able to explain to people who aren't data scientists. Um, but equally, there are kind of tools that you have such as data visualization and storytelling and kind of learning how to build kind of really good and compelling presentations that can help to explain how your solution works and ultimately get people excited about the impact it will have on them. Um, so you'll have to bear with me <laughs> a little bit with this slide. So um, I just wanted to give an example of how a conversation with a customer might go with these commercial skills. It's obviously a hugely simplified conversation, but I'm hoping that it helps to demonstrate where each one of those skills can come into action. So. Um, the customer who is the, this person who owns a cinema or works at a cinema says, we want to understand our best customers um, more so that we can market to them better and find more people like them. Our marketing team will use your findings. So as a data scientist, you probably will want to learn more because you might not have much experience or knowledge of their industry. So you kind of want to pick their brains and understand what's important to them. So you might say, what does best look like? Is it your high value customers that are part of your loyalty scheme? And are there any limitations with your marketing that we need to take into account? Because um, in your models, you might need to take into account certain constraints. So it's kind of a good chance to collect some information about that. Then they might say something like, currently we'd like to grow the lifetime value of our customers. So how much they spend is the most important. Realistically, we can't make more than five different campaigns for any marketing we do because we have a small team. So you can see there, they're not, they're just speaking in their language. They're not kind of trying to solve your problem at all as a data scientist. So you might go away and think that um, it sounds like a supervised problem because they've specifically pulled out lifetime value as being something that's important to them. So understanding the customers that have the highest lifetime value and why is kind of a good route to go down. Um, decision trees are kind of a commonly used supervised method that would help to do that 
where you can also fix the number of groups that you get at the end of it. So you could fix that so that you get five different customer segments at the end, because they've also mentioned that they can only run five campaigns at any given point in time. Um, another nice thing with things like decision trees and building models or certain types of models is that then you can understand what factors have an impact on predicting lifetime value too, which can be useful insight to give back to the customer. Because if you can say that using popcorn again, but they're eating popcorn or the customers that like pop popcorn tend to be more valuable, then they know that like kind of marketing to people with popcorn or appealing to those customers more um, might be a good strategy for them in the longer term. So you've gone away, you've kind of done your problem formulation, you've built your segmentation model. Um, and then you might say something like this to the customer. So um, your customers can be split into five groups from low to high lifetime value. So that's using your communication skills, very like simple everyday language, no kind of data science jargon in there at all. Um, this chart shows that your highest value customers are five times more like more valuable than your lowest value customers, um, giving them a visualization or chart to kind of work from there. And then the characteristics of your high value group are X and Y. This means you could market to them by doing Z. So you're giving them a bit of insight as well to kind of get them excited about the work that you've done. And then they basically say, thank you. You've understood everything I wanted to do um, and taken into account kind of how their process works so that, so that they can actually use it. Um, so hopefully from that example, you can see that data scientists need to really like constantly use our commercial skills when talking to customers and actually doing the data science work as well, um, which is important because sometimes commercial skills can just be seen as how good you are at talking to the customer. And it's actually kind of a lot, a lot more than that. I feel like, oh no, there we go. Thought my slide was stuck then. Um, so now moving on to kind of the most recent part of my career, which has been in the tech industry. Um, so I moved to Peak about three and a half years ago now. I mean, the time's gone very quickly. Um, and I joined Peak as a data scientist. Um, I had a lot to learn when I first joined, um, being from like a more mathematical and statistical background. I definitely had that theoretical knowledge, but I had not actually used many machine learning techniques before. So I had a lot to learn there. Um, I also learned a lot more about different technologies such as AWS and um, coding became more of my daily job again. Um, my two previous roles hadn't had involved certain aspects of coding, but certainly not something that I did day to day. So I kind of got a lot more practiced at kind of coding, which was which was great. Um, but something that I thought I'd mention as well is that I thought I think that specifically at that point in time, I definitely had something that I brought to the team too. Um, a lot of people, like in the data science team at that point, didn't have much industry experience. And given that I'd worked in the marketing industry for three years and built up kind of some knowledge and understanding of how it works and how data can be really exciting and used within the marketing industry. Um, it definitely gave me kind of like a strength that I could lean into when I joined Peak. Um, it's kind of also worth mentioning at this point, especially given the event that we're speaking at, that it was my first real experience of working in a predominantly male work environment. Um, up until that point, even at university, I don't know if it was just I don't know, my imagination, but it really felt like things have been relatively equal. And so it certainly was in my kind of first two roles. Um, and yeah, so it was really at this at, at peak where I noticed the lack of diversity within the tech industry. And it became something that I felt really passionately about and have wanted to kind of use my, like being in the industry as a way to try and bring more people into it essentially. Um, and this relates to kind of my general career lesson that I've learned whilst being at peak, which is that if you have ideas on how certain things can be changed, then actually try and change them. Um, and an example of this that I have is that 
um, me and one of my colleagues, Circa, I don't know if she's on the call, but she might be, um, thought that the maternity policy at peak could be better. So um, rather than, I mean, we obviously gave this as feedback, but rather than just giving this as feedback and handing it over to someone else and kind of expecting them to do the work, um, we helped to come up with the new policy ourselves and worked really closely with our people team in order to do that. And I appreciate like not everybody can go away and overhaul their maternity leave policy. Um, it, it does depend a lot about how the company you work at manages change. But I think my point is, is that there's even kind of very small opportunities day to day where um, things need to get done. And if you notice that and you act on them and you follow them through that people will really appreciate that. So yeah, there are just really small things as well as the bigger things, but you can, you can change them. Cool, so now, now back to programming rather than my kind of philosophical career lessons. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how much of a surprise this might be to some people or whether it's a well-known fact, but data science isn't all about building models. Um, and a lot of extra work often needs to be done to integrate a model into the process that you're trying to improve. So in order to kind of help with that, kind of right from the offset, you need to design the solution that you're building in a way that means people will want to use it. And I've given a few examples of decisions that you might need to make to kind of bring that to life on the left of the slide. Um, so firstly, you'll need to make decisions about how frequently you want to receive new data. So if we go back to our cinema segmentation example, if the marketing team wanted to send out an email on a weekly basis, then you know that you at least need to update your data once a week because you would want to take into account any changes with the customer base over that week before they send out the next campaign. You'll also need to decide how often you want to update your model, which is also known as retraining it. Um, so in our example, we don't necessarily want to keep updating and retraining our model too often as we want the marketing team to kind of take our segments on board, build a marketing strategy around them, and then keep customers in those segments for a fixed amount of time, if that makes sense. So customers could move between the segments if their preferences changed that the segments themselves should stay the same so that the marketing team can build up really strong content and communication around them. And finally, you'd also need to choose the right output for your solution based on what it is the customer wants. So if they want help with making decisions, then you might go with something like a dashboard where you kind of surface the outputs of the model back to them so that then they can use that as kind of another input of information to make a decision but it doesn't necessarily do it automatically whereas if they would like kind of more of an automated process from beginning to end you might consider something more like an api so that your solution can easily interact with any other services that they might use so again just bringing it back to our example if the marketing team used an email service provider that they wanted to send customers email, like targeted emails with based on what segment they're in. As a data scientist, you might have to take into account like, okay, so how can I integrate with that email service provider and kind of tell the email service provider or push the information of what customer is in what segment um, to make the life of the marketing team easier, essentially. Um, so as well as building something that your customer is going to want to use, you also need to make sure it doesn't break, which again, it sounds really obvious, but there's so with all these solutions end up being like hundreds of lines of code. So you really need to make sure that it's robust so that they don't get frustrated with it and stop using it. Um, and I won't go into loads of loads of detail here, but there are tools like GitHub and Docker that can be used to version control your code and make sure that it's deployed in a stable environment. And you can also do things like set up alerts um, at certain points to make sure that your scripts are kind of running properly so that if something goes wrong, you're the first person to know about it 
and you can fix it before you kind of have a customer come to you saying, oh, did you realize this is broken? And you're like, no, I didn't. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> um, so yeah, just a few tips there. Um, so a lot of data science projects will start um, by say using something like Python and R just to load in data, explore it. You might make some charts and play around with some different models. Um, but then actually the end result can look something a bit more like this. This is the kind of system that we use at Peak called Kodi. Um, but obviously like only Peak people will have used that. But the point is, is that it will have multiple steps, use like several different scripts, if not tens of different scripts. And that could amount to thousands of lines of code. Um, so whereas you start by just wanting to build a simple model in the end to make something kind of an end-to-end -end solution, it's going to have multiple steps along the way. And the final thing that I thought I'd mention around programming was that when you've finished your project, you might not actually want to stop there. So if you think that the code would be useful for either yourself in the future, because that's a good benefit, or someone else in your team, that you might want to spend some time generalizing it. So um, I've contributed to our own segmentation package at Peak, which means that our data science team can quickly and consistently deliver customer segmentation projects. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great to build out packages and functions that people can use again and again. Um, but if you do do that, it's worth remembering that you do have to have the documentation to back it up. Um, because if you've written most of the code, then you need to be able to, going back to the communication point, you need to be able to communicate with data scientists how you've built this solution. Um, so at Peak, we use Gitbook for a lot of our documentation, but even kind of simple things like adding comments into your code and working, writing Word documents that explain how your solution works can be really, really helpful. So you just need to find a way to explain what it is that you've done and put it in writing. So that's an overview of the three skills that I think every data scientist needs and where in my career that I've learned them. Um, just to bring it all together slightly, because um, I realize there's lots of different skills and examples. Um, I've summarized how everything comes together in this diagram, which kind of shows you a data science project kind of from beginning to end. So at the beginning of a project, you might use your problem formulation skills to turn that real world problem into a data science problem. You'll then use your theoretical knowledge to look into a few different types of techniques such as supervised and unsupervised methods to kind of figure out which one you might want to use and is most appropriate for the problem. You'll then combine that theoretical knowledge with your programming skills to actually turn that into a model that you can put into production. Once you've done that, you will want to communicate what you've done back to the customer um, and any kind of insights that you found along the way as well. And then finally, you'll want to use your programming skills to automate and deploy that code in a stable way and so that the customers can use it and also potentially generalize it so that you or someone else can use that code in the future. So just to kind of finish off, it's worth me saying that like my journey to be a data scientist has been one of many. So I started off learning about the theory at university, then some commercial skills within the marketing industry, and then developed out my coding skills whilst being at peak. But I've met so many different data scientists along the way who have learned these skills in a completely different order. And also sometimes you learn some of them obviously at the same time, this is me just kind of simplifying things. Um, so there's no right or wrong way to do it is kind of the point that I'm trying to make. And um, even me as a data scientist, like I'm still learning how to be a data scientist and developing in all of these skills. And now that I'm a manager, I've kind of thrown in a fourth circle or skill into the mix, which is management, which honestly could just be like a whole other talk in its own. Right? <laughs> I tried to fit some stuff in there in this talk, but I was like, there, there is no room. Um, so I've put together a few kind of 
tips for people who want to develop in each of those different skills. Um, I won't necessarily go through them all here, but I'm more than happy to kind of share them around afterwards. But it's essentially almost a combination of learning, reading, studying things. Um, so if you take commercial skills in it, as an example, data visualization is a huge area in its own right. So just kind of finding some websites so i really like information is beautiful just to inspire you in terms of how to make great visualizations um it's just a way to kind of develop out those skills but equally like data science is very practical so it's all good and well learning stuff but you also need to get some practice um so like a common place that people tend to use is kaggle it's got loads of different data sets loads of tutorials um, so it's definitely worth going on there if you've not already and want to kind of build out these skills. The only slight like warning I would put around Kaggle is that, and tutorials in general, is that they can often tell you how to do something in data science. So they'll get you from loading in the data to building a model and making predictions but they don't necessarily go into much detail about how the models themselves work. And I do think it's worth putting time in, whether you do a tutorial to look into the methods that you're actually using. And the reason it's important is sometimes that you build a model and it doesn't work. And I think if you don't understand how the model works in the first place, you won't be able to understand why it's not working to solve a particular problem. Um, so that's just a bit of a kind of I guess, bit of advice or a common pitfall that I see some people fall into sometimes when trying to get into data science. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on, um, a while back now, um, I do think it's really important that you find, that everybody finds a job, that they love the work that they do and they love the people that they work with and the company that they work for. And I feel like, that's definitely what I found at Peak. Um, so I thought I'd include this in case anybody was interested in joining the Peak team. So we've currently got a few vacancies open. So an insight analyst, data scientist and graduate scheme vacancy. Um, but equally, if you're not looking for a role, but you do think you'd benefit from some mentoring, then we do offer that too. And it kind of goes without saying that you can all feel free to add add me on LinkedIn and kind of chat to me whenever you want, if you're ever looking for advice or just to talk to someone else in the industry. So that's everything.